Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. The Webster Dictionary definition of suspicion is rather lacking in its ability to clearly denote the insidiousness which affects the ensnared mind. At its inception, suspicion is more like a tiny worm that bores its way into the psyche and takes up residence there. It can lie dormant for weeks or months, but it never dies. It hibernates quietly in the recesses of the mind, waiting to be fed with more doubt. Suspicion is the dark side of the mind. There is no joy or happiness where suspicion is present. It can paralyze its victim into non-action or create a state of numbness which robs the victim of their ability to reason correctly. Why am I so obsessed with the word suspicion? The simple answer is that all the devastating events of the past three months started with a small, unexpected observation which planted the worm of suspicion in my mind. Up until that event occurred, I would never have had the slightest doubt of the faithfulness of my wife of 16 years. Five days of the week I am awake before my wife and the children. I have formed this routine which has me slipping out of bed and moving quietly into the exercise room located in the basement. I have several modern exercise machines which permit me to work out undisturbed for a half hour or more while the rest of the family is sleeping upstairs. A vigorous workout on the bench flex machine and the treadmill wakes up my entire body. It was a Thursday morning when I woke up a little earlier than normal. Rather than lie in bed for another 15 minutes, I got up and headed down to the exercise room. I finished my workout early and headed back upstairs to shower and get dressed for work. Kathy was not in the bed as I walked into the bedroom. I opened the bathroom door in one quick motion and stepped inside. Kathy was standing there about to put on her bra. I smiled at her and then my eyes caught the sight of a strange dark black and blue mark on Kathy's left breast. The mark was oval-shaped about the size of a half dollar. My eyes flashed up from the dark mark and locked on to Kathy's surprised face. There, in the space of about 20 milliseconds, was a look I had never seen in Kathy's eyes. Those eyes flashed a strong sense of guilt as her mind registered the fact. I had just seen the dark mark on her breast. It was as if I had caught her in some type of lewd act. The look of guilt quickly changed to a look of shame as she turned her body away from me and proceeded to put her bra on. No words were spoken in that very brief but embarrassing moment. Kathy smiled as she moved past me and out of the bathroom. I stood there dumbfounded trying to get my mind around the situation which took place in that very brief encounter. My mind would not let go of the sight of the dark mark on Kathy's breast. It sure looked like a love bite. A hickey caused by an intense sucking on one spot of flesh. What was it really? Why was it there? Did Kathy bruise herself in some manner to get that black and blue mark? My mind was not willing to accept the other alternative explanation for the origin of her bruise. The warm water washed over my body as I stood in the shower. I tried my best to expunge the incident from my mind. The best I was able to do was to push it back inside my mind as I began to think of the work day that lie ahead of me. At the breakfast table Kathy was her normal upbeat self as she hurried around getting me and the kids ready for the new day. Jason and Christy had their usual sibling knit, picking at each other while they finished their breakfast and headed out the door to catch the school bus. I saw you looking at the bruise mark on my breast in the bathroom, Kathy said as she finally sat down across from me at the table. I injured myself yesterday at work. There was an open file drawer I bumped into and hit my breast against it. It was really dumb of me and it left a small black and blue mark. Her face was calm and nonchalant as she shrugged her shoulders as if to indicate there wasn't anything more to say about the bruise. Normally, I would not have given the matter any more thought except there was the momentary look of guilt in Kathy's eyes when I first saw the bruise. It was the look that her explanation could not satisfy in my mind. I just nodded my head and finished eating my toast. We did our usual hug and kiss as I walked out of the kitchen and into the garage. Kathy would leave for work about 15 or 20 minutes after I left. There was a lot on my mind about the customer meeting which was scheduled for this morning. The bathroom encounter and Kathy's explanation dropped off my radar screen as I drove to work. But unknown to me, the worm of suspicion had been planted in my mind. It just borrowed itself inside and went asleep. Kathy, my beautiful 39-year-old wife, and I live what many would call the ideal American lifestyle. We live in a nice neighborhood of upper-middle-class suburbia. We are both college graduates and have professional careers which we constantly balance with each other and our two children. Jason, our oldest child is 13 years old. He is a bundle of energy that rivals Duracell Bunny. There is middle school, music lessons, swimming, soccer practice, and soccer games which keeps him very busy. Christy is our 11-year-old daughter. She is her daddy's little princess. Even during her early years, she had mastered the feminine skills that can bend and wrap me around her little finger. Just as in most other father-daughter relations, 
I know I am being manipulated, but I am helpless to defend myself when she turns on her sweet charms. My name is Paul Matthews. I am a year older than my wife. I have been employed at the Equity Corp for the past 12 years. My current position is that of section manager responsible for the maintenance department located at the corporate headquarters. There are 24 people in my department who have maintenance assignments ranging from heating and air conditioning equipment to computer and telephone installation. It isn't a very stressful job for me. I have very talented people working for me who know their jobs better than I do. Rarely do I have to do any business traveling. Once or twice a year, I attend a conference or seminar on new innovations in building maintenance. Kathy has gone with me on several of these out-of-town business trips. Kathy is the Director of Human Relations of the local TV cable company in our area. The high level of job responsibility makes Kathy feel very good about herself. In addition, her job has also done wonders for her self-esteem. After our daughter was born, Kathy thought her professional life was over and she would be relegated to the status of Susie Homemaker and a stay-at-home mom. By the time Christy was three years old, it was obvious that Kathy would need to get some outside activity which would challenge her more than cleaning up after toddlers and making meals. At first Kathy was torn between her guilt and depression. She felt guilty that she could not cope with the demands of being a full-time mommy. Yet, she was depressed over the fact that all of her college education was ebbing away without ever being fully utilized. All of that changed when Kathy's sister, Evelyn, moved into the same neighborhood. Evelyn and Kathy were total opposites. Evelyn Hunter was the consummate mother and homemaker. She had no desire to challenge the world with her business acumen or to be some eye candy at a receptionist's desk. Motherhood suited her just fine. Having her husband Todd being the principal breadwinner was the way life was supposed to be in Evelyn's mind. The Hunters have three children, a boy and two girls. Alan was the oldest followed by Alexis and Alyssa, his twin sisters. It didn't take long for our two children to become adopted by their Aunt Evelyn and for them to spend much of their free time at their cousin's house. This was a blessing for Kathy. She and Evelyn worked out an arrangement which allowed Kathy to begin pursuing a professional career while her sister would be the den mother. That was eight years ago. Kathy landed her ideal position with Cablenex, the local TV cable company. She was hired as human relations manager reporting the regional managing director. The job was everything Kathy had hoped for in a job. It gave her a sense of accomplishment and at the same time gave her some freedom away from the office. One of her major job responsibilities was the interviewing of potential subcontractors for Cablenex. She had to ensure that any subcontractor hired by Cablenex complied with all of the state and federal hiring guidelines. Several weeks after the encounter in the bathroom with Kathy's bruised breast, I was reviewing the proposal specifications for a new telephone exchange system for the corporate offices. I discovered a number of important items had been overlooked in the draft proposal. I took to task the two employees directly responsible for writing up the specifications. Although it was unusual for these two employees to screw up, I gave them a good dressing down and I sent them off to correct the draft. This incident had frazzled my already tense nerves. The entire order would have been seriously compromised if I had not caught the error in the draft. I decided I needed to get out of the office for the rest of the day and do some stress-relieving exercising at the gym. As I left the office, I told my secretary I would be gone for the rest of the day and to only call me if a 9-11 type tragedy happened to the company. She smiled at me and just nodded her head. The next two hours were spent in a heavy workout at the gym which included swimming a hundred laps in the large pool. Several minutes in the steam room and a nice hot shower made me feel like a new man. It was 2.10 in the afternoon when I walked out of the gym. For a quick second, I thought about returning to the office. My refreshed mind quickly squelched that idea. Let the group run itself for the rest of the day. As I was driving home, a nasty thought flashed across my mind. I had read and heard stories about husbands returning home unannounced to find their wives in the bedroom with a lover. I smiled at that thought. Kathy would never be unfaithful to me. Then the little worm of suspicion in my psyche wiggled its ugly head, and the thought of the guilty look in Kathy's eyes gave me a twinge of doubt for a split second. I pulled into the driveway. No strange cars in the driveway. The garage door went up. No cars in the garage either. The children were still at school and Kathy would be at work for another three hours. Peace and quiet all for myself as I entered the silent house. After quickly changing into some sweatpants and shirt, I went into the den and put on some smooth jazz. I no sooner sat down in my recliner to relax when the phone began to ring. Damn it anyway. I thought to myself as I got up to answer the phone. It better not be the office calling. Hello. I said as I picked up the phone. Is this the Matthews residence? A female voice on the other end spoke. 
My mind first jumped to thinking this was a telemarketer making one of those annoying sales solicitation calls. Yes, it is. Who is this calling? I sounded annoyed as I challenged the caller. Oh, I'm sorry to have bothered you. I was wanting to talk to Kathy Matthews. The female voice sounded very apologetic. She's still at work. Can I take a message for her? I wanted to end this interruption and get back to my solitude and my glass of Jack Daniels. Would you be so kind? This is Nancy Cobb. I wanted to call her and tell her about the cost to get my car repaired. My mind jumped for a minute. Kathy didn't mention anything to me about a Nancy Cobb. Can you give me the information, Nancy? My voice had now changed to a more pleasant tone as my curiosity had peaked. Yes. Tell Kathy the body repair shop said the cost would not exceed $550 for the taillight and dent in the fender. Nancy's voice sounded like a middle-aged woman. All right, Nancy. Tell me more about the accident and what happened. My voice was nonchalant hoping that Nancy would fill in all the details. Well, it was last week Tuesday when Kathy backed into my car in the parking lot. She didn't do any damage to her car, but the edge of her bumper smashed the taillight lens and made a small dent in the fender. It wasn't very bad. So Kathy told me to get an estimate and she would pay the cost of repair. She didn't want to report it to the insurance company. I can understand why she wouldn't want to do that. Those insurance companies will raise your premiums at the slightest chance. It sounded to me like two women solving all the world's problems in a parking lot. So, I imagine they have these kinds of accidents all the time in the mall parking lot. I said to Nancy as I scribbled a note for Kathy. Yes, I imagine the mall parking lot accidents occur all the time. Nancy said as I was about to end the conversation. But this one occurred at the Pine Tree Motel parking lot. Wham! My mind snapped up at that last statement. So, Kathy was at the motel a week ago on Tuesday and she backed her car into your car. Is that correct, Nancy? I tried to make my voice sound natural and not convey the tightness that was gripping my chest. Yes, that's correct. I had gone over to see my sister who was staying at the motel. My husband does not like my sister at all. So, I have to meet her at the motel whenever she comes to town. I was getting out of my car when Kathy backed out of her parking space. She must not have seen my car behind her when she bumped into it. It was a good thing she wasn't going very fast or the damage would have been greater. I thought for a moment about what question to ask Nancy next. Too much chaos in my mind so I just asked. Is there anything else about the accident you can remember, Nancy? Well, nothing other than to thank the man who came over to look at the damage and tell me that my car was still very drivable. But he said I should get it fixed before the police gave me a ticket for driving with a broken tail light. Was Kathy upset by the accident? I could hear her take a deep breath as she thought for a second. Yes, she was. That was until the kind gentleman came over to assess the damage. He was so helpful about the incident that he calmed us both down. Did the man work for the motel? I asked. No, I don't think so. In fact, I think Kathy knew him although she didn't say that she knew him. I wanted to ask her what this kind gentleman looked like, but that might have raised some suspicion on Nancy's part. She might think she gave me more information than she should have. Well, thank you Nancy. I'll give this information to Kathy when she comes home. Does she have your telephone number? I gave her my number when she gave me her business card. I asked her for her home number also which she wrote down on the back of her card. Just in case she lost your phone number, Nancy, could you give it to me again? She gave me her number both home and cell phone. Thank you, Nancy. I'll give this information to Kathy as soon as she gets home this evening. We said our goodbyes and hung up. I sat back in the chair and looked up at the ceiling. My thoughts were bouncing around inside my head. What now? What was this all about? Kathy had not mentioned anything about a car accident to me. That was something she would have surely told me as soon as saw me. Also, why would Kathy be at the Pine Tree Motel on a Tuesday afternoon? The answer could be as simple as her interviewing a new subcontractor at the motel restaurant. There didn't have to be anything clandestine about her being at the motel in the afternoon. I was trying to rationalize this latest bit of unsettling information which had just come to my attention. There could be a hundred different harmless answers which could explain her being at that motel. Still in the back of my mind, the worm of suspicion stirred once again. Maybe it is the worst possible answer. Maybe Kathy has a lover. How would you ever know for sure? It took two more Jack Daniels to calm my nerves. By then the kids came racing in from school. They gave their usual hello dad and headed upstairs to their rooms. Christy came down about a half hour later and went into the kitchen to start the supper that Kathy had prepared before she went to work. I was still sitting in the recliner trying to relax when I heard the garage door open and Kathy came in. She walked over and kissed me on the top of my head. You're home early, Paul. Anything wrong at work? She asked as she rubbed her hand along my cheek. Nothing major. 
I just left early to go to the gym for a workout and a swim. I needed to do some stress relieving. My smile never gave any hint of the turmoil going on inside my mind. Christy shouted out that supper was just about ready to put on the table. So Kathy turned away and went upstairs to change clothes. Supper time was the usual chatter among the four of us as we ate and talked about our day. Jason was giving an update on the science project he was working on with his school friend Ethan. Christy was chattering away about her English class and the book report which was due next week. It was the typical suburban family enjoying each other and sharing the important things of the day. Kathy mentioned that her company was expanding their coverage territory and she was very busy lining up subcontractors to help with the cable installations. I sat there taking in all this wonderful chatter, thinking what a wonderful family I was a part of. What about you, Dad? How was your day? Christy asked as she gave me her daddy's little girl smile. It was a little more stressful than usual at work. There was a major mistake in the latest telephone specifications. I nearly blew my top at the group. Instead, I gave them instructions on what needed to be fixed, and then I left the office for the rest of the day. I went to the gym for a good stress-busting workout, and then I came home to relax with my loving family. I smiled back at Christy. Tomorrow will certainly be a better day in the neighborhood. I winked at her as she giggled at my remark. I looked across the table at Kathy and then spoke. Oh, by the way, Kathy, a Nancy Cobb called this afternoon while I was here to tell you she got the estimate to get the damage to her car repaired. Nothing in the tone of my voice gave any hint of my concern. Kathy almost choked on the food she was swallowing. Our eyes locked for a second. There again was a surprised look of guilt in her eyes. The same look that appeared when I walked in on her in the bathroom and saw the bruise mark on her breast. Her facial expression was one of shock and instant fear. She would like you to call her tonight. Her car is at the repair shop and she wants to talk to you about the cost. The initial estimate is around $550. There was no accusatory tone in my voice as I waited for Kathy to reply. I could see Kathy's mind was working at 100 miles an hour as she was formulating a response in her mind. She lowered her eyes to look at the food on her plate, but it was obvious she couldn't continue to look me directly in the eyes. What else did Nancy say about the accident? Kathy finally said in a low voice, Mom had an accident? Jason blurted out as his eyes opened wider at the prospect of some exciting news. I guess so, Jason. It seems that Mom backed into this lady's car in a parking lot. My reply cut off Kathy's answer. Gee, Mom, when did this happen? Was anybody hurt? It was Christy's turn to jump into the conversation. Slow down, you two. Give your mother a chance to tell us all about it. I tried to hush the children down so Kathy could talk. Did Nancy say anything else about the accident? Kathy asked her question again. Not that I can recall. She seemed like she was in a hurry or something. I lied. Something I had never done to my wife. Was it a little white lie? Or was it a lie of entrapment? Kathy seemed relieved for the moment. It was just a minor fender bender in the parking lot. No one was hurt, and there was no damage to my car. The bumper of my car broke the lady's taillight and make a small dent in her fender. That's all that happened. No additional details were forthcoming. I was kind of disappointed. When did this happen, Mom? Where did this happen? Jason jumped back in with his questions. It happened last week, Wednesday. I went to the mall to get a birthday gift for Carol at work. Thursday was her birthday, and I needed to get a gift for her. Kathy replied in a calm, matter-of-fact voice. You were at the mall and you didn't take me? Christy looked at her mom with surprise. Mall shopping for Christy ranked up there with a having a slumber party with all of her girlfriends. I ran over to the mall at lunchtime. It was a quick in and out trip. I got Carol a silk scarf along with a charm for her bracelet. Kathy replied as Christy had a childish pout on her face. Maybe Nancy was wrong about the day. Maybe it was Wednesday and not Tuesday as she said on the phone but I don't think she could be that wrong about where the accident occurred. Why did Kathy have to change the location in the day? The suspicion worm burrowed deeper into my conscious mind. That look in Kathy's eyes. The shocked expression on her face. What is going on behind those eyes? What is my loving wife trying to conceal from me? So, it was no big deal, huh mom? Jason said in a disappointed voice. I guess he was hoping for a more dramatic accident. A broken tail light didn't raise his level of interest. That's right, Jason. No big deal. It's just that Carol's gift is going to cost me more than I really wanted to pay. Kathy said with a soft smile on her face. She seemed to have recovered her composure very quickly. I didn't pursue the issue any further. Later that evening, the children were up in their rooms doing their homework. Kathy had gone off to our bedroom to return Nancy's call. Maybe she wanted to talk to Nancy in private. I didn't question why she needed some privacy for the call. The stereo playing and the TV off as I sat in the den. 
There was an open book on my lap and a Jack Daniels in my hand. My mind was in its most analytical mode at this time. It was slowly and methodically going over the past several months, trying to uncover any more clues or unusual events which might further support a theory of infidelity that was forming in my mind. Nothing, not a single thing, except that bruise mark during those months would make me suspect anything had changed in our relationship. Our sex life had not suddenly gotten better or gotten worse. Kathy was still the same loving and considerate wife. She didn't dress differently. She didn't go on business trips or have to work late evening hours. So why won't this suspicion in my mind go away? But there was that look in her eyes. Twice. A look I had never seen before. Her facial expression of surprise and guilt for only a fleeting second could not be explained away. And now the lying about the car accident. These ugly thoughts were causing my chest muscles to tighten. I told Nancy to have her car repaired, and I would pay the repair shop as soon as the work was done. Kathy said as she entered the room. Her words snapped my mind back to the present tense. She gave me an inquisitive look as if she expected me to say something more about the accident. I didn't comment or ask any questions. I'm sorry I didn't mention the accident the day it happened, honey. I just was very tense over the incident and I didn't want you to stress over it. I was going to tell you after I got the call from Nancy. It seems you got her call first. I am sorry I didn't tell you sooner. Kathy sat down on the sofa across from me. I had the feeling there was something she was still concerned about, but she didn't know how to broach the subject. Maybe she found out that Nancy told me where and when the accident really happened. Maybe she was wanting me to question her about the discrepancy in her story. I'm glad you settled the matter with Nancy. I'm glad it wasn't any more serious. Was my simple reply. After my response, Kathy seemed a little more relieved. Aren't you going to watch Lost tonight on TV? It is on tonight, isn't it? Her questions seemed now to put the accident incident to rest. No sense in her mind to dwell on this sticky issue. No, I think I'll skip the show for now. I have enough convoluted mystery and intrigue going on at this time. I'll let Jack and the rest of the crew on the island manage by themselves this week. I smiled at her and took another sip of my drink. Well then, I think I'll go upstairs and pour myself a hot tub filled with bubble bath. Then I'll soak in it till my skin turns pink. Kathy said as she got up from the sofa and walked over to me with a smile on her face. She leaned over and kissed me on the forehead. Would you check on the kids before you come to bed? I want to make sure their homework is done and make sure they don't stay up too late. Her voice was the same sweet loving voice that I've come to know and love for these past 16 years. Sure will, lover. I'll crack the whip if I have to tame those two monsters of ours. Now go and enjoy you soak in the tub. I made a kissing sound with my lips as she smiled and walked toward the stairs. Don't stay up too late, lover boy. I'll be in bed waiting for you. She giggled as she walked up the steps. Kathy is one sexy and passionate woman when she gets in the mood. A hot bubble bath always gets her in the mood. I knew we were in for a hot night between the sheets when I came up to bed. My first thought was how those suspicions might affect my intimate feelings toward the woman I love and worship. I had no tangible proof of any infidelity on her part. Nothing but this nagging worm of suspicion that wouldn't go away. An hour later, I shut everything off downstairs and went up to check on the kids. Jason was intent on the video game he held in his hand. Okay, young man, show me the homework assignment. I said as I quickly snatched the Game Boy out of his hands. Oh, Dad, I was just about to get to the 10th level. Now you messed it all up, Jason said with a pout on his face. You'll have all summer to get to the 12th level if that's your goal. Right now, we're trying to get you through the 5th grade at school. I poked him gently in the ribs. Now the homework, young man. Christy was already in bed. She heard the noise from her brother in the other bedroom. Now she wanted to play the daddy's little girl routine on me. It always worked. I kissed her goodnight and turned the light off. Sex that night with Kathy was incredible. We spooned our bodies together in a lover's embrace and fell into a peaceful sleep. That Saturday, Kathy and her sister went off to do some girl shopping. The children were over playing with their cousins while Todd had the babysitting responsibility. Lucky me had nothing special to do and a quiet house all to myself. Since I was restless, I decided to wash both of our cars. Evelyn had driven her SUV. So Kathy's car was still in the garage. It was a great day outside, so I took my time washing and vacuuming the two cars. I cleaned the carpets and then did the trunks of both cars. While I was vacuuming the trunk of Kathy's car, I saw a small piece of white plastic sticking up from the edge of the wheel well compartment. I pulled back the mat and found a white bag lying on top of the spare tire. When I opened the bag, my heart almost stopped inside my chest. Inside the bag were several intimate apparel items including a sexy lace bra, panties, garter belt, and black stockings. 
The items looked like something a woman would buy at Victoria's Secret. I had never seen these garments before. All of the sale tags were removed from them, so I knew they were not brand new, and they looked like they had been worn before. The crotch and the panties had a distinct smell of female odor. Kathy's smell. I stood there dumbfounded looking at a bag full of garments which had only one purpose. Was I holding the smoking gun in my hand? Was this the missing link in the story I had been forcing myself to deny for the past several weeks? I put everything back in the bag and returned the bag where I found it. I put away the cleaning equipment and put Kathy's car back in the garage. Anyone who might have seen me at that moment would surely think they were watching a robot or a zombie walking around the cars. I was in a daze. My mind refused to function correctly. Nothing but chaos and confusion reigned inside my mind. Finally, I locked up the house and drove to the corner convenience store. I bought a six-pack of beer and then drove over to the lake. There was a secluded parking place away from the weekend crowd. Sitting back with a cold beer in my hand, I tried to make some sense of the events of the past couple of weeks. Until I found the lingerie in the trunk of Kathy's car, all I had were vague suspicions that Kathy might have been unfaithful. Now, with the latest discovery, could there be any doubt of her infidelity? I didn't think there could be any other reasonable explanation. Still, I had no idea of what I should do next. Confront her immediately? Demand explanations and proof of her fidelity? Should I remain silent until I had definite, undeniable proof? But even then, what would I do with the damning evidence? Should I divorce her? My mind, which is usually very good at analyzing problems, was failing me miserably. There seemed to be no win-win solution to the dilemma if in fact Kathy had cheated on our marriage. It took several hours to finish the sixth beer. The sun was setting on the horizon across the lake. I felt a slight buzz from the alcohol, but I was far from being intoxicated. I also realized I was hungry and needed to get home. But, how was I going to act when I got home? What kind of existence would I have to live to maintain the status quo? The missing part of the equation was Kathy's explanation for all of my suspicions. Could she have rational reasons which would dispel all of my doubts? I arrived home to find Kathy on the phone. She turned and looked at me as I entered the house. Her face was filled with worry and concern. My God, Paul, where have you been all afternoon? You had us worried sick. You weren't here when Evelyn and I got back from shopping. Todd didn't know where you were either. There was a high level of angst in her voice as she put down the phone. I walked into the kitchen area and got a glass of cold water from the refrigerator. Our eyes never connected until I sat down at the table. I was out at the lake. I have a lot on my mind that I needed to think about and try to sort out. I looked up at her and our eyes locked. I could see the fear in her eyes. There was fear mixed with anxiety as her mind was trying to assess the words from the person sitting at the table. What's wrong, Paul? Are you sick or something? Her words were full of concern, but they did not convey the dread she was feeling inside. Yes, you could say I'm sick, but it's not a physical illness. I'm sick in my soul. At that moment, Kathy's stoic demeanor crumbled before my eyes. There was no doubt in her mind that I knew her secret. She slowly sank down on one of the kitchen chairs. What's his name? Are you in love with him? My voice was calm. No anger or accusing tone of voice. Kathy looked at me as tears welled up in her eyes. His name is Carl Goering. And yes, I am in love with him. I just sat there looking at my sobbing wife. Her brief confession did not stun me. It did not make me sick to my stomach. The suspicions I had about her infidelity had just been confirmed. Now, the angst I'd been living with since I found her stash of sexy lingerie in the trunk of her car washed out of me leaving me an empty emotional shell. If you are in love with him, I guess that it means the end of our marriage. My voice was still calm. Oh God, no, Paul. Kathy cried out as a terrified look spread across her face. I still love you, Paul. My love for Carl does not diminish the love I have for you. Kathy's voice cracked and her body shook as if she had just gotten a blast of cold air. Well, you're sadly mistaken if you think I will ever accept the role of a cuck. And I do not wish to live with a woman who professes her love for another man. I can see no other recourse for us except divorce. I moved out of the kitchen area and into the den where I slumped down in my favorite recliner. I did not want to look at my unfaithful wife any longer. To me, the decision for a divorce was now a foregone conclusion. It took several minutes for Kathy to regain her composure enough to speak to me. She sat on the sofa across from me. She sat there quietly for a moment before she spoke. I know this must be a terrible shock to you, Paul. Finding out I have been unfaithful to you. But I really think you should listen to my explanation before you end our marriage. She tried to speak in a soft, loving voice, but I just turned my face away from hers. Tell me one thing, Kathy. Do you still want to have a sexual relationship with this Carl guy? 
She closed her eyes, took a deep breath and simply answered, Yes. Then there is nothing left of our marriage. Since you are the adulterous partner, I will file the divorce papers in the morning. I will seek primary custody of the children. I do not wish to expose my young, impressionable children to an adulterous environment. If you want Carl as your lover, then it will have to be without having custody of the children. My voice had taken on an aggressive tone. It was time to exert my position as the head of the family and the aggrieved husband. Kathy's infidelity may have wounded my ego, but I was not about to roll over and let her have the children. Please, Paul, don't do this. I told you I still love you. I don't want a divorce and I especially do not want to have my children taken away from me. Kathy was sobbing and trembling again as the reality of my decision was setting into her mind. Your I love you statement is a farce when you also profess your love for another man. Your actions speak louder than any of your words. Your actions tell me I am not the man who can completely satisfy you as a woman. I cannot and will not accept a cuck position. I hung my head and in a softer voice said, I want you to pack a suitcase and leave this house immediately. I no longer want to be in the same house with you. You have lost your right to be a resident in this house. No, Paul. You can't just throw me out like an old shoe. This is my home. My children and I live here. Kathy was nearly in hysterics as I rose to my feet. I live here. I live here with my children. You are an adulterous woman, and I won't have you living in same house with us. I shouted at her as my anger rose inside me. Now get your clothes packed and leave this house. I'm going to get the kids at Evelyn's, and when I get back I don't want to find you in this house. I walked to the door, turned and said, I'll be back in an hour. Don't be here. Tell Evelyn where you will be staying, and I'll see that you get the rest of your belongings. I closed the door behind me as Kathy continued to beg me to reconsider. As soon as I walked into the hunter's house, Todd could see there was something terribly wrong. He had never seen me looking so distraught. What the hell has happened to you? Todd asked as he walked over to me. Bad shit, Todd. Very bad shit. I said as I leaned against the wall. I rolled my head from side to side slowly as I spoke. Kathy has gotten herself a lover and she doesn't want to end the affair. It's over for the two of us. I told her to pack some clothes and leave the house. I'll be filing for divorce in the morning. Todd stood there stunned at the words I had just spoken. There was never any sign that our marriage was in trouble. Just the opposite. Kathy and I appeared to be the ideal married couple with two lovely children. Just then, Evelyn came around the corner and saw us standing there as shocked silence. What's going on here? Her eyes moved rapidly back and forth from her husband's face to my face. Paul just found out that Kathy has been cheating on him. Todd said sadly as he looked hard at his wife. Do you know anything about this? Kathy tells you everything, doesn't she? Evelyn's face could not hide the fact that she knew about Kathy's secret. She didn't tell me everything. Only that she had met her long-lost high school sweetheart. She didn't tell me she was sleeping with him. Her voice wasn't that convincing. So, you knew something was not right with this, didn't you, Evelyn? I barked at her in an accusing voice. I tried to tell her not to get involved with Carl. Their relationship in high school was in the past, and she should not jeopardize her marriage trying to relive some teenage fantasy. Her eyes were now focused on a spot on the floor. She couldn't look me directly in the eyes. How long ago was this, Evelyn? I snapped at her. About eight weeks ago. Evelyn said in a small voice. What else do you know? My anger was still very building. Kathy told me Carl owns a small construction company. He didn't know Kathy worked for Cablenex when he applied for subcontracting work. Kathy was shocked when she first saw his name on the application form. Evelyn moved out of the hallway and sat down on the sofa. Her head was bowed as if in embarrassment. After she told me she met Carl for lunch, she no longer talked to me about him. I tried to find out if anything was going on between them. She refused to talk to me about Carl. Evelyn let out a deep sigh. I had a dark suspicion that she was beginning an affair with Carl. Todd had not said anything as his wife confessed her knowledge of the contact between Kathy and Carl. He had no idea of what to do or say at this time. Goddamn women. I shouted at my sister-in-law. Even though she is your sister you should have told Todd or me that something might be happening with Kathy. Now it's too late. Our marriage is over. I told Kathy to pack her bags and get out of my house. The veins in my neck were very pronounced as my anger was getting out of control. Terror flashed in her eyes as Evelyn looked up at me. You're not throwing Kathy out into the street. She's your wife and I know she loves you, Paul. Evelyn was now beginning to cry out loud. She also told me she loves Carl and that she wants to continue her affair with him. I shouted back at her. That goddamn tramp deserves to be out on the street. I knew I had to get away from Evelyn before my rage exploded out of control. 
Where's Jason and Christy? I turned to Todd. They're in the backyard playing. Todd said as I turned and walked to the back door. The phone was ringing on the end table as I walked out to get the children. The two youngsters ran over to me as soon as they saw me. Come on gang. Let's go and get some burgers at Mickey D's. I said with a forced smile on my face. Can the three A's come with us, Dad? Christy asked with a girlish smile on her face. Sure they can. If their mother and father say it's okay. I replied. Let's go in and ask them. Christy called out to the others as she raced inside the house. Evelyn was on the phone talking to Kathy. Why was Aunt Evelyn crying when I went into the house? Christy asked from the backseat of the car. She's having a bad day. I think she got some bad news that disturbed her. I replied to his daughter. Is that why she said she wanted Alan, Alexis, and Alyssa to stay home tonight? Dad? Jason interrupted the conversation. I guess so, Jason. There's a lot of things going on right now that will upset a lot of people. We can talk more about this when we get home. Jason and Christy were finishing up their french fries when I turned away from them and pushed the speed dial button on my cell phone. The phone rang several times then a female voice answered. Hello? It was Evelyn's voice. In a quiet voice I said to her. We're going to be leaving here shortly and when we get home Kathy better not be there. The children were more interested in the things going on around them to pay any attention to my phone conversation. Paul, be reasonable. Kathy is having a major emotional crisis over this. She has no place to go and she doesn't want to be without her children. Evelyn was trying to be the mediator for her sister. I don't give a damn where she goes. She can go live with her new lover for all I give a damn. My rage was building again. She better not be there when we get home, or the children will find out the hard way what a cheating and immoral woman their mother really is. I pressed the off button and took a deep breath as I tried to suppress my anger. What's wrong? Daddy? Christy asked as she saw the strange look on my face. I tried my best to smile and acted nonchalant. Nothing really, sweetie. We'll talk more when we get home. The house was empty when the three of us arrived home. Where's mommy? They both asked as they saw the empty house. She had something she needs to do. Mommy will be away for a while while things get straightened out. I sidestepped the serious answer to the children's question. I knew very soon I would have to have a very hard talk with both of them. Now get upstairs to your rooms. I want that homework done in the next hour. I'll be up to tuck you in and say goodnight. When I walked into the bedroom, I noticed there were a lot of Kathy's clothes missing on her side of the master closet. Her cosmetics were also missing from the vanity in the bathroom. Even though my anger was still paramount, I felt a strong sense of loss as the reality of Kathy's absence set in. Still, I knew there would be more anguishing moments lying ahead of me. I lay back in the dark bedroom looking up at the ceiling. There were so many details I would have to address in the immediate future. Most important would be the emotional health and well-being of my two children. How do you tell your children that their mother will no longer be living with them? That she will not be there to love and comfort them every night? That she will not be there to be Dr. Mom when they are sick? In my own mind, I was struggling with my decision to fight for custody of the children. I wanted them to grow up happy and healthy. Would they be better off living with their mother and her new lover? Maybe it was my wounded ego. Maybe it truly was my devotion to my children but I soon rejected the idea I could give up the children to my adulterous wife. I would fight tooth and nail to have them continue to live here with me. The next several days were traumatic and heart-wrenching for me. I immediately began the divorce process. Through my attorney, I was able to get a restraining order against Kathy from coming in contact with me or the children. Kathy hired a lawyer and was fighting the restraining order, but the results would take a week or more in the courts. Jason and Christy were now confused and upset with the events which were happening in their once happy and loving home. I had sat down with them and tried to explain that their mommy and daddy were having some serious problems remaining married to each other. The children could not understand what was happening and why their parents could not just kiss and make up. I told them there were issues which were too serious to just forget about. I did not specifically tell them about their mother's new lover. As gut-wrenching as these episodes were with the children, I was determined to stick to my position. When I finally talked to Kathy on the phone, a week after I made her move out of the house, I issued my first threats to her. I told her there are laws in our state against alienation of affection by a third party. I told Kathy if she insisted on fighting the issue of my custody of the children, I would file charges against Carl and sue him for alienation of affection and destruction of our marriage. I also told her I would report her affair to the senior executives at Cablenex as a conflict of interest on her part. She would probably be fired from her job and Carl's company would be prohibited from doing business with Cablenex. Kathy's continued to plea with me to cancel the divorce actions and let her return home. 
These pleas were met with my sarcastic remarks about her having made her choice. I made it quite clear I would not be a cuck or live in an open marriage arrangement. Adding to insults, I told her that I was never interested in sloppy seconds and I don't keep damaged goods. The phone call ended with Kathy still pleading with me to reconsider. Next, I had a long talk with my sister-in-law about Jason and Christy visiting with their cousins. I told her in no uncertain terms would not I permit Kathy to be at Evelyn's house if the children were there. I set down the rules of conduct that would govern my relationship with the Hunter family. Evelyn finally capitulated to my demands for the sake of the five children. She knew if I would restrict or cancel the visiting between the cousins, both families would suffer. The divorce papers were drawn up with me as the primary caregiver and having custody of the children. Kathy took my threats seriously and withdrew her objections to that part of the arrangement. She would have visitation rights on every other weekend, provided her lover was not present during those visitations. She would pick up and drop off the children at her sister's house, so I would not have to be present when she came to their house. This mutual agreement permitted the divorce process to continue. A month after Kathy moved out of the house, I looked into the bathroom mirror and saw a man who had aged 10 years in the space of four weeks. Every evening the children pressed me about making up with their mother so she could move back in with us. These confrontations were having their toll on the three of us. In addition to losing my wife, I now felt I was on the verge of losing the love of my children. I took an early vacation from work to spend more time bonding with the children. Slowly the tension between the children and me improved, but I could still see they missed their mother and their once happy family life. Being a single parent was becoming very stressful for me. I finally hired a housekeeper to maintain the household and be a live-in maid. I also did this to ensure that an adult would be at home when the children returned home from school. Margarita was an elderly Latino grandmother who accepted the position. She moved into one of the guest bedrooms and immediately took over all of the household chores. It didn't take long for Jason and Christy to adopt her as their foster grandmother. In addition to her household chores, she also began teaching the children the Spanish language. A quiet stability slowly returned to the Matthews house. The children stopped pressuring me to allow their mother to return to the house. The weekends the children spent with their mother soon became part of their routine. They seemed better able to adjust to not having their mother live in the same house with them. The return home after their visitations with her became less stressful for them. Margarita always had their favorite meal ready for them when they returned home from their visit with Kathy. Still, it wasn't the same loving family anymore. My life was particularly stressful because of trauma I suffered after the discovery of Kathy's infidelity and then the loss of her presence in the house. Down deep I truly missed her love and companionship. I went about my daily routines at home and at work as best I could. At times my actions were more robotic than that of a thinking individual. There was a huge hole inside my mind and soul. Something very valuable had been ripped from my perfect life. Something that might never be able to be replaced. The once close relationship between the hunters and me now had a very large chasm between us. The cousins remained very close friends and still shared much of their time together. But the closeness I once had with Evelyn and Todd had diminished to almost nothing. Because of the rules I had set down weeks ago, Evelyn had never tried to persuade me to give Kathy another chance. Evelyn was caught between loyalty to her sister and her feeling that Kathy was solely responsible for the misery which now existed in the two families. One evening when I went over to pick up the children at Evelyn's, she took me aside and handed me a large manila envelope. I know the rules you set down about my getting involved with this marital crisis you and Kathy are having, but I absolutely believe you need to read the letter Kathy has written to you. It's in this envelope and it may contain some of the answers to questions you have been afraid to ask. Please don't destroy this letter before you read it, Paul. She handed the envelope to me. I took it reluctantly. I will not bother you further about this situation. It's between you and Kathy. I only want to plead with you to read the letter before the divorce is finalized. You owe it to yourself. I hesitated in speaking to Evelyn. We both knew she broke my standing rule about her getting involved. Instead, I just grimaced and walked past her to retrieve the children. I left the hunter's house with the children chattering away and with the envelope in my hand. It was several days of looking at the unopened envelope I had taken to work. Supposedly inside the envelope was an explanation and possible confession written by my soon-to-be ex-wife. Do I dare read it? Would the contents of the letter be like salt in the wound and increase my anger toward her? I opened the envelope on the third day. I sat alone in my office after telling my secretary not to disturb me. There appeared to be about a dozen pages in the envelope. They were written in Kathy's beautiful cursive handwriting. Just seeing her handwriting gave a sudden jolt to my chest. At first, 
I thought about feeding those pages to the paper shredder, but I didn't. Slowly, with tears forming in my eyes, I began to read the first page. My dearest loving husband, it is my sincere wish that you read this entire letter before you make your final decision about the future of our marriage. Since we have been unable to sit down face to face and discuss the situation we find ourselves in at this time, my only recourse is to write you this letter and try my best to explain everything concerning this crisis from my perspective. I know that some of what I have to say, you may find contradictory and irrational from your point of view. Still, I need at least to do my best to communicate the facts as I see them. First and most important, I want you to know that I truly love you more today than I did the day we were married. You must believe this fact even if you doubt everything else I have to say in this letter. These past 16 years have been the best years of my life and I owe all of them to you and our wonderful children. And I truly wish to remain your wife for the rest of my life. Second, you need to know that none of what has happened recently was any fault of yours. You are the most wonderful husband a woman could ever ask for. Nothing, and I do mean nothing, in you or your relationship with me drove me into the arms of another man. You completely satisfied me in and out of the bedroom. What has happened was not due to any deficiency in you. Thirdly, I have no clear explanation of the how and why things turned out the way they have. I never in my wildest dreams or nightmares could have envisioned a scenario which would have brought you and I to this critical junction in our lives. If what follows in this letter turns out to be disjointed or jumbled, please bear with me. It's a hard story to tell, and I hope I can tell it so you can fully understand why I am in this heart-wrenching dilemma, and why I still am begging to you not to end our marriage. My story starts out during my sophomore year at Crestview High School. I was a happy young girl who was just beginning to blossom into a lovely young woman. It was in March of that year, three months before end of the school year, that Carl Goering transferred into Crestview. Carl's dad was a major in the U.S. Army who was sent to help with the training of the reserve soldiers at the local armory. The Goering family moved into a rental house about three miles from the high school, the opposite direction from where I lived. Carl ended up in three of my classes, English literature, trigonometry, and biology. It was obvious from the first week that the school Carl had previously attended was not on par with Crestview's curriculum. Carl was having a hard time keeping up with the rest of the class. One day, on a dare from my best girlfriend Betty, I went over to sit with Carl during lunch period. He was sitting by himself. I guess he was trying to figure out how to break into the school's student body instead of being looked on as an outsider. Carl was a little surprised and I think somewhat happy when I asked if I could sit with him. This first lunch meeting was just an introduction. It ended up that Carl and I had lunch every day from then on. Betty even joined us most of the time. That's when Carl told us about his dad, his mom, and his little sister Jennifer. The Goering family had moved around the country and several overseas locations in the 20 years Carl's parents were married. Such was life for the family of a career soldier. After that first week of lunch meetings, Betty and I began to tutor Carl in the classes he was having trouble keeping up. The three of us formed a study group which helped Carl enough that he graduated to junior grade with a 3.2 average. We were all proud of his accomplishment. Yet during all that time, neither Betty nor I actually dated Carl. We were just happy to hang out together and enjoy each other's company. That summer, between our sophomore and junior years, Carl was sent to his grandparents' ranch in Idaho. I was pretty bummed out for those three months till school started and Carl returned from Idaho. Even though Carl and I had not been on a formal date, I was beginning to have some very strong feelings for him. I even challenged Betty to see if she was becoming infatuated with Carl. But, Betty had her eyes set on a different guy in our class. Before school began in the fall, I knew I would get Carl for my steady boyfriend when he returned. After Carl returned for the fall semester, it was obvious something was wrong in his life. I finally got him to tell me that his father was not happy with his current assignment and was pressing his superior officers to transfer him to an active duty unit somewhere in Europe. The thought of relocating again had both Carl and his mother very upset. Within the first month of starting back to school, Carl and I had our first date. I was on cloud nine. I had someone who I was truly falling in love with. You might think it was puppy love or just a teenage crush, but in fact it was more than that. As Carl and I became exclusive with one another, we found that we were emotionally compatible and that our ideals were very similar. Even though Carl and I were steady dates, we never had sex together. There were some nights parked in his car where some very heavy petting and groping took place, but we never crossed the line. He never fingered me or asked me to touch his genitals. Both Carl and I thought sex was to be saved for marriage. We would often sit in his car, looking at the stars and telling each other the various versions of how our life would be after we got married. Carl was adamant that he would not become an army officer like his father. 
He saw the effect all the moving around from base to base had on his family's life. That was not the life he wanted for his new family. He looked forward to settling down, establishing roots in one town with one woman and a house full of kids. The holiday season came around very fast that year, or at least it seemed that way to me. On Christmas Eve, Carl gave me a friendship ring which he said was to be my pre-engagement ring. It was a very merry Christmas and a happy new year for me. Spring came racing around as the bond between Carl and I grew stronger and stronger. I was fearful he would be sent back to his grandparents' ranch again once school let out for the summer. He told me he would fight that decision and find a summer job somewhere around town. It was the last month of the school year when the bomb dropped. Carl's father had finally convinced his superior officers he would be able to contribute more to the army at an active duty station. He got his transfer orders to Stuttgart, Germany. Carl came to school the next day, and I immediately knew something was terribly wrong. My first thought was that his father was going to send him back to his grandparents for the summer. When Carl told me he and his family were moving to Germany by the end of June, my world literally exploded. I broke down in hysterics and had to be sent to the nurse's office. I was a total wreck for the remainder of the school year. My grades plummeted. If it had not been for my previous high grades, I would never have passed on to my senior year. All kind of thoughts raced through my mind. I even told Carl we should run away and elope. But Carl was the cooler head. He knew we were way too young to make it on our own. The day finally came when Carl's family left for the airport and their new life in Germany. Our farewell was like someone tearing my heart out while it was still beating. I was totally devastated. It was a good thing we were out of school for the summer. My parents saw the depression I was in and managed to get me into counseling and therapy before school began in September. The therapy did help me, and I continued with it through all of my senior year. Carl and I wrote daily letters to each other. You have to remember this was the time before the internet and email. Our letters were both loving and sorrowful. We missed each other, and I firmly believe the separation was increasing our love for each other. I did not date any other guys during my senior year. In fact, I did not even attend the senior prom at the end of the year. I was Carl's girl, and I would remain faithful to him no matter what. Instead of chasing and dating other boys in my senior class, I concentrated all of my efforts on improving my grade point average and making a high score on my SAT test. All of that effort paid off in the form of acceptance and a scholarship to Cal Berkeley. My sister Evelyn was already a student at Cal Berkeley. She would be able to help me with the relocation and getting me started on campus. All of those wonderful things made me very happy. In his letters, Carl also praised my efforts and the results. Still, I didn't look forward to the summer with us still thousands of miles apart. In August, the second bomb went off, but it was not as immediate in its destructive force as the first bomb about the Goering's move to Germany. This time the bomb came as an interruption to the stream of daily letters which Carl and I exchanged. There was an entire week where I didn't get any mail from Carl. I became very worried about Carl, and I even tried to contact him by phone. That didn't work out, the phone number had been changed. In the next letter I received from Carl, he told me his dad had been accidentally killed during a training exercise. His letter was very short, and he told me he was having difficulties with his mother. He did not elaborate. I continued sending my daily letters to Carl trying to extend my sympathy for the loss of his father and trying to give him some encouragement during those very tough times. The last letter I received from Carl told me his mother was very sick and she had been sent to a hospital. He was now trying his best to care for his younger sister and to put the family things in order. He signed his letter professing his undying love for me and stating one day we would be together. I continued to write Carl every day even though I was not receiving any response. September found me on the campus of Cal Berkeley with my sister Evelyn. I was not sure I was emotionally ready to take on the challenges of university life. All I could think of was my true love in Germany facing some extremely hard tasks and I was not there to help him. If it had not been for Evelyn helping me through those first months at the university, I'm sure I would have flunked out. It was during the Thanksgiving holidays the first of my letters was returned to me marked, Return to Sender. Address C Unknown? That small notice on the envelope was like a dagger through my heart. I had not gotten a letter from Carl in over a month. Now it seemed he would not be receiving any of my letters. I was a lost soul. Nothing in my life seemed to matter to me anymore. I felt I could have died and not regretted leaving my empty world. Once again it was Evelyn and her constant mothering which gave me the courage to move forward. I finally had to resume my therapy. This time it was with a different therapist. Through her help and guidance, I pulled myself together and once again focused all of my energy on my studies and future career. Still, something deep inside was missing. It must have been part of my soul because I felt spiritually numb and void. After a full year of not hearing anything back from Carl, 
I pushed his memory to the back of my mind and essentially laid him to rest. All of his previous letters were packed in several shoe boxes and stored in the back of my closet. As a side note, Paul, you never knew about those letters. I kept them stored away until the day you proposed marriage to me. Your love and that proposal began to heal my wounded soul. That weekend, I burned all of Carl's letters and scattered the ashes into San Francisco Bay. Carl was finally put to rest forever. Or so I thought. I never told you about Carl. And I told all of my family never to mention him to you, or to me, ever. What followed after college were 16 of the most wonderful years that a woman, a wife, and a mother could ever ask for in her entire lifetime. You must believe those words, Paul. They are the absolute truth. This next section of my explanation may sound strange, and some of it absolutely absurd. There will be things in this letter that defy logic and rationality. Yet, after all the dust of my words has settled, you will find one terribly torn and bedeviled woman. A woman who has had to come face to face with some very serious revelations in her life. As you know, one of my major responsibilities at Cablenex is to review and approve all subcontractors who perform work or services for Cablenex. The review process of my department focuses on the subcontractor's past and present compliance with all of the state and federal labor laws. We do not issue work contracts to subcontractors who employ illegal immigrants or who violate the work hour laws. Subcontractors are required to fill out a lengthy application form in order to qualify for a Cablenex contract. These applications are screened by two of my assistants, and those applicants who pass the initial screening are then sent to my office for my review. It was March 22nd when a stack of applications was placed on my desk. There were six folders for my review, which I began right after lunch. The third folder I opened was the application form from the KG Construction Company. I read the summary page that Loretta, my assistant, had done as part of her initial review. Her summary comments were very favorable for KG Construction, so I began to read the details on the application form. When I got to the section of ownership of the company, it was like I was just slammed into a brick wall at 60 miles an hour. Carl Goering, sole owner of KG Construction Company. I don't know how long it took me to catch my breath after reading Carl's name on the application. My mind seemed to explode inside my head. Confusion reigned supreme inside my shell-shocked mind. Could this person be my Carl Goering? Could this person be the Carl Goering who had professed his undying love for me so many years ago? The rest of that day was a total waste for me. I told Loretta to do some more detailed background checking on KE Construction Company and the owner, Carl Goering. I left work early that day and came home to try and get my mind under control again. I needed you and the children around me to reinforce the loving bond we share as a family. As hard as I tried, I could not entirely push the thought of Carl back into that dark cold dudgeon where his memory had been imprisoned for over 20 years. I remember we had a great family night with the four of us chatting and enjoying several games of Scrabble before the children went off to bed. I also remember that we did not make love that night even though I was in the mood to have you take me intimately. The rest of the week for me was like working in a forced labor camp. I drove myself exceedingly hard to keep my focus on the daily assignments. Friday came and went with Loretta still doing her background check on KG Construction. Saturday and Sunday were totally hectic days for me, on purpose. Every small project I had postponed up to that point I jumped on with gusto. You even remarked that I must have taken a double dose of my morning vitamins. It was a Herculean task inside my mind to suppress the thoughts of Carl from overwhelming my conscious mind. Monday morning, Loretta came in with another small stack of application folders. She told me the background check on KG Construction was on top. She left my office and closed the door behind her. I remember looking at the top folder as if it were a poisonous snake ready to strike. It took me several minutes of staring at the folder before I reached over and opened the folder. There on the first page of the background check was all the information I needed to confirm that this Carl Goering was in fact my Carl Goering. The report also indicated that he was single divorced for eight years and living in Gilmore about 26 miles from my office. My body went cold as the flood of suppressed memories slammed into my conscious mind like a tsunami wave. All of those feeling which I thought were long forgotten and buried rose up and shook me to my core. It was impossible for me to think any thoughts other than thoughts of Carl and the young love we shared so briefly 20 years ago. Once again, I turned to Evelyn for her advice and console. She knew there was a serious problem when I came to her house early in the afternoon to talk to her. She was the only living relative who knew about Carl and the relationship we shared before his father was killed in Germany. She had always been my rock and steadfast advisor. Now I needed her advice more than ever. After telling Evelyn about my discovery, she had a very bewildering look on her face. 
It took her several minutes to compose her thoughts before she told me I must forget all about Carl and leave his memory rest in peace. Although it wasn't necessary, she reminded me about the fabulous life we have as a family. She told me Carl was in the past and must remain in the past if I wish to keep our family whole. I knew she was right. I knew I had everything a woman could possibly want or expect in a loving family relationship. Still, there was the nagging voice of curiosity that wouldn't shut up inside my mind. The following week my curiosity could no longer be contained. I had Loretta set up a meeting with Mr. Carl Goering for the following afternoon. Carl had no way of knowing who I was other than I was the final person in the approval process. He was just asked to come to Mrs. Kathy Matthews' office the next afternoon. Despite all my efforts to control myself, my emotions were a raging inferno. What would happen during that first meeting? Would Carl remember me? Would there be any feelings left between us? I didn't sleep very well that night. Driving to work that morning was like driving to wake. The apprehension was almost overwhelming. My conscience was in full rebellion. Every nerve in my body was frazzled. At 2.30 there was a knock on my door and Loretta stuck her head around the door to tell me Mr. Carl Goering was here for his 2.30 appointment. Carl stepped into my office and Loretta closed the door. There was a split second where Carl looked at me with a confused look on his face. Then he simply asked, Kathy, is that you Kathy? I stood up from my desk on legs which seemed as if they were made of rubber. Yes, Carl. It's me. Kathy. Neither one of us knew what to say next. It was silence for a very long second. Then I told him to take a seat in front of my desk. I could tell Carl was as a mild state of shock at seeing me for the first time in over 20 years. He wasn't sure what he should do or say. I asked him how he was and commented on the fact he was looking very fit and healthy. Still, he was having trouble coming to grips with the situation. I changed topics and then began to tell him about the approval process. He just sat there not saying a word as I told him his application had been approved and that he would be able to contact the director of installations to receive his contract assignments. How I managed to speak to him for over 15 minutes without breaking down like a quivering bowl of jello, I'll never know. I just smiled politely when I was done and asked if he had any questions about the contract or the work. He just slowly shook his head, no, but his eyes never left my face. When I indicated the meeting was over, he was very slow to rise from the chair. As he got to his feet, he finally seemed to gain some control over his initial shock. He thanked me for approving his company, and then he said he would like to meet with me for lunch. I told him we could meet the next day at Brandon's restaurant across the street from my office. He looked pleased at my response, but was still unsure how to end the meeting. So he just smiled and said he would meet me at Brandon's the next day at noon. After Carl left my office, I slumped back into my chair. There was a tightness in my chest as I realized the first lover in my life had just been resurrected from the dead. Nothing happened the next day over lunch except that Carl told me the awful details of what happened after his father was killed. His mother had always been a frail woman. The news of her husband's death caused a nervous breakdown. She had to be committed to a mental hospital. Carl was now forced to assume the role as the head of the family. There was his little sister he had to comfort and support. The army arranged for Carl and Jennifer to be sent back to live with the grandparents. Their mother remained behind in the mental hospital as Carl and his little sister returned to Idaho. Before Carl and his sister had settled in at their grandparents, they were given the news that their mother had committed suicide in the hospital. In the brief period of less than a month, Carl and Jennifer were orphans. Carl told me his grief and the burden placed upon him with the deaths of his parents was the major reason he stopped writing to me. He felt he would no longer be able to uphold the promises he made to me. There were other more serious demands placed on him. He wanted me to be happy and to move my life forward. So he stopped writing to me in hopes I would find another man to love. At no time during the lunch conversation did Carl make any statements that he wanted to become a part of my life again. He knew I was married and the mother of two children. I believe he was sincerely happy for me and for my life as your wife. The luncheon ended with a handshake as Carl walked to his car in the parking lot. I went back to my office and tried to get on with my daily work. Unfortunately for me those early memories would not go away as much as I tried to push them into the background. Evelyn continued to advise me not to see Carl again and for me to forget about him. I never told her any more about my meetings with Carl. I guess I was too ashamed to tell her of my adultery. Paul, I really did try to follow Evelyn's advice. For over a week I wrestled with my internal demons. The following week, I finally gave in and called Carl and asked if we could meet for lunch again. That next luncheon was the beginning of my infidelity. There was no seduction or sex involved. But during our meal, I confessed to Carl the fact I had never stopped loving him. He confessed the same to me. 
At that moment, I knew I needed to have Carl as part of my life once again. It was me, Paul, not Carl who started the wheels in motion for what would become several sexual trysts for us before you made your discovery. Somewhere in the following weeks, I became a different person. Somehow, I began to feel I was two different women living in the same body. When I was with you and the children, I was the same loving wife and mother I had always been. When I was with Carl, I was that young girl again finding my lost love and once again having him in my arms. I knew it was wrong. No excuses, no defense for my actions. All I can truly say to you, Paul, is my love for you has never diminished. Contrary to many stories you may have read, there was never any competition between you and Carl in my mind. You are my husband, and he could never be my husband. Those were my thoughts during those days of confusion and turmoil for me. Never, and I mean never, did I ever consider leaving you for Carl. All I can hope for at this juncture in our lives is that you will reconsider your decision to proceed with the divorce. I do not want to be the ex-Mrs. Paul Matthews. I want to remain your wife and to live together as we have since we were married. But as much as I would like to say to you that I will never see Carl again, I would only be lying to you. Carl is back in my life and I don't want to lose him again. This is not the way a marriage is supposed to work, my darling husband, but I cannot help myself for feeling the way I do now. It is my wish we can some way come to an arrangement which would permit us to live together as the family we have always been and to share it with my dual life. If you can find it within your heart to meet with me, maybe I could better explain my feelings and answer any questions you may have of me. But, my darling husband, I desperately want to remain your loving wife. I love you now and forever. Your loving wife. I sat there with the letter in my hand. I now knew more about Carl and Kathy than I had before about their past relationship. It may have been a lost, unfulfilled teenage romance for Kathy and Carl, but I would not be any part of its fulfillment. Kathy's letter was a true confession, but it changed nothing in my mind. I knew now there could never be a full reconciliation between us. She once again told me she needed Carl to be part of her life. There was no way I could be a part of that arrangement. I put the letter back in the envelope and filed it away for some future date when I would let Jason and Christy read it and understand why their parents divorced. I went silent about reading the letter. Evelyn finally stopped me several days later and asked me if I had read the letter. I wasted time reading that letter and in short your sister wanted my permission to remain married to me and still open her legs to her lover. She is not sorry for breaking my heart and my family. She just wants me to roll over and accept her cheating. So, it changes nothing. Whatever Kathy and I had for 16 years is now over. I do not care to meet with her or ever see her again. The divorce will be finalized next week. I turned and walked away from a very sad soon-to-be sister-in-law. The divorce decree was finalized without me being in attendance. I had my attorney attend the hearing when the decree was made official. I was told Kathy was there and cried as the judge issued the pronouncement. I had my wish. I was never forced to come face-to-face -face with Kathy. Whenever necessary, I would inform her of my plans with the children through her sister. The instructions would simply be for her to remain away from us and not to try and interfere with them. In effect, she no longer existed in my world. I really wanted to catch hold of the a-hole who ruined my marriage, and I really wanted to punch him in the face and kick him the balls. But I had kids to take care of, and I never wanted Kathy to try and take the kids away. So, I decided to take my anger and channel to creating a better life for my kids. Six months after the divorce, Kathy and Carl married. Over the next two years, they Kathy gave birth to a baby boy. They remained living in Gilmore. Kathy's close relationship with Jason and Christy continued over the years. Christy was especially thrilled when her mother gave birth to her new stepbrother. I never met with Kathy or her family after the divorce. In my mind, she died the day I made my fateful discovery. I remained the stern and loving father who became totally involved with the children as they grew up. I refused to go any dates with the numerous females who constantly tried to become involved with me. Kathy was the only woman I would ever love enough to want to be intimate with. In place of sex and female companionship, I focused my attention on the children, my job, and I even became involved in local politics. It was at their 18th birthday that my kids were given the letter that their mother had written to me. I told them that I held on to the letter till I thought they were old enough to understand why I divorced their mother. They understood and supported me. That did cause them to start distancing them from their mother and her family. I guess after all these years, I will get some sort of satisfaction. Love may be a many splendored things. But love can also be a very destructive force when Cupid decides to play his practical jokes. So, it was for Kathy and me. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.